Hello and welcome. I'm James Ryder, Director of Donor Relations at Denver Seminary. Thanks for joining us for today's uh, In Perspectives panel entitled Sexual Abuse and the Church. But we want to know, let you know that complacency, complicity, and silence on the matter of sexual abuse in the church contradicts God's call to protect the vulnerable, bring healing, and seek justice. These realities also undermine the credibility of the gospel that we proclaim to believe and preach. Today, we will examine how churches can prevent sexual abuse, meaningfully respond to, uh, when such abuses come to life, and be part of the healing process for victims and their families. Just to let you know, our next panel will be on Thursday, November the 10th. The topic is called uh, Pastoring Amid the Great Resignation. Details can be found, as always, at denverseminary.edu forward slash events. Also, if you don't know, we have a podcast called Engage 360. Denver Seminary and our guests address the larger conversations taking place within the spheres of evangelicalism, theological education, and cultural engagement. You can also find that at denverseminary.edu forward slash podcast or wherever you get your podcasts. Now for today, let me give you a few uh, instructions. Uh, thank you for joining us. As I said, we will not be using the raise hand feature but we, or the chat feature. Now people can, you can submit your questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. You can upvote something that you think is apropos, something that you would like to ask as well. Now we won't be able to answer all questions, but we will do our best to choose the ones that are most relevant to the discussions. Let me invite our panelists and our host to turn on their microphones and their videos. So we start with our host, uh, Dr. Eric Suddeth. He's the Associate Professor of Counseling here at Denver Seminary. Uh, Eric holds a PhD in Counselor Education and Supervision from the University of Mississippi, an MA in Marriage and Family Therapy from Harding School of Theology, and a BA in Youth and Family Ministry from Harding as well. Uh, Dr. Uh, Suddeth is a licensed professional counselor, clinical supervisor, and counselor educator. Uh, his research has focused on teaching preparation within counselor education and supervision in the doctoral programs. Uh, Dr. Sedev has a passion for teaching and training doctoral students to be effective instructors, and he enjoys reading and writing about narrative therapy and investigating the effectiveness of blended and online instruction. Uh, Dr. Sedev, please introduce our panelists, and I'll leave it to you. All right. Thank you, James, uh, and welcome to all of you. Um, uh, I'm not sure where you're on the screen. Uh, you can see our panelists, but I will first introduce Kim Norris, uh, Kimberly Norris. Kimberly Norris is a partner in the Fort Worth, Texas law firm of Love and Norris, providing child sexual abuse expertise to ministries worldwide. Uh, after representing victims of child sexual abuse for more than 31 years, I believe that's uh, what we talked about, uh, Kimberly Norris and her husband Gregory saw recurring predictable patterns in predatory behavior. And out of that, uh, grew ministry staff out of a desire to place this information in the hands of ministry professionals and providing churches of all sizes with effective safety protocols to protect the church and its children from the devastating impact of child sexual abuse. Ministry trains uh, over 11,000 ministry personnel each month, and I think it's over, over uh, a million folks now, a couple million folks that she's trained in both live and online formats. So welcome, Kimberly. Thank you. Good to be here. Our next panelist is Dr. Paula Tipton. Um, Dr. Paula Tipton holds a PhD in counselor education and supervision and, and MAs in both counseling, psychology, and Christian thought. Prior to joining Denver Seminary's faculty, she taught at Northwestern University, Trinity Evan Evangelical Divinity School, and Colorado Christian University. Paula worked with uh, Agape Movement, teaching high school English, biology, and Bible in Swaziland, Africa, and also worked in a mission a station clinic where she learned to deliver babies and treat a variety of infections, which is a super cool thing about you uh, that I just learned like uh, yesterday. She spent six months in um, Kinshasa, Zaire, working with a team to train pastors and church leaders and principles of evangelism and discipleship. She also has considerable experience in working with victims of sexual abuse, as well as those who have perpetrated the abuse. So uh, thank you, Dr. Paula Tipton, for being here. 
So Denver Seminary believes in theological education that needs to be, uh, rather theological education needs to be uh, able to engage with real world questions and the needs of the world, but always within the framework of the gospel and the truth of scripture. So as we engage in this particular perspective today, uh, I just want to alert you, the audience members, that some of the topics today uh, related to sexual abuse may be difficult for some listeners. We're incredibly thankful that you're here, but want to make sure um, that you all are aware, obviously, of, of what we're addressing today. So with that in mind, uh, we're going to begin uh, with our questions. So I think maybe first and foremost, it might be helpful for our audience to hear a little bit about um, maybe just understanding our terms uh, a bit about what we're talking about. So uh, if you could, uh, Kimberly, um, can you help us to understand that what the term sexual abuse, sexual assault, and sexual harassment uh, might mean? Sure. And I think this is important because um, churches and particularly denominations tend to conflate these issues. And from a legal standpoint, there's a significant difference between these three separate um, offenses because it, from where the church is concerned, most directly as it relates to reporting requirements, mandatory reporting requirements. Um, so it's important to kind of frame our terms, I believe. Um, sexual abuse is child sexual abuse. So it's either an adult to a child or a peer-to-peer -peer issue um, where a child is sexually abused. Sexual assault from a legal standpoint um, is typically, typically a adult to adult type of behavior. So it is non-consensual sexual interaction between one adult and another adult. In other words, the second adult is not consenting to this behavior. It's forced or coerced, or the second adult does not have a capacity to consent. The third category is sexual harassment. And that's typically a, a workplace phenomenon, at least from a legal standpoint. It can also have some crossover into higher education, universities, Title IX stuff. Um, but in the world at large, sexual harassment is unwanted sexual interaction, adult to adult in the workplace. Um, so my place of specific expertise is in child sexual abuse issues, child sexual abuse prevention. Um, as you said, I've practiced in that realm for 31 years. So um, separating those terms is important in terms of addressing the church's response to those. Obviously, any one of those things you don't want happening in a church or ministry. Um, but your response is different in those separate types of categories. Right. Absolutely. And it sounds like better understanding maybe the definitions of those terms will, will help us as we're discerning um, what type of response and who to reach out to and those sorts of things. Okay. Sure. Uh, Paul, is there, is there anything uh, that um, you would like to add there related to, um, besides the legal definition of the term, maybe um, um, from your clinical perspective or working with churches? Uh no, I would just add that you know, in terms of childhood child sexual abuse, that you know, uh, in terms of the way people talk about it, sometimes that a child uh, cannot consent ever to mm -hmm. sexual activity. Period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Important implications, I think, too, when when thinking about some of uh, how uh, later on we talk about grooming uh, perpetrators, how they groom yeah. um, children for 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 that. Uh, thank you. Okay, um, so. As we, as we think about the, the prevalence of child sexual abuse in the church, um, can you speak to maybe a little bit about, um, and Kimberly, we'll, we'll start with you here again, if that's okay, um, maybe some of the statistics, because I think as we're discerning, you know, is this thing happening more uh, often in the church, less often as we maybe we see in uh, outside the church and those sorts of things, just to kind of help us wrap our mind uh, around the, the phenomenon, so. Yeah, so in the U.S. and Canada and, and most developed nations, the statistics um, across the board are one in four female children, one in six boys will have been sexually abused before he or she reaches 18 years of age. And that, that statistic does not skip the church. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the place where we really, um, we have a very strong misconception in evangelical context, in my experience. Um, because we think somehow, some way that statistic is skipping us. In fact, it, it a couple of recent studies indicate it might be slightly higher in uh, spiritual contexts that have a paternalistic leadership. Um, so it doesn't skip us. It's one in four female children, one in six boys will have been sexually abused before he or she reaches 18 years of age. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I would add to that that 
um, even kind of making the situation worse is that 20% of all the abused children are actually abused before the age of eight. So it's a high number of really young children and that 90% of abusers or 90% of, of children will know their abusers are not strangers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think it brings in a, a, maybe a, an important point too, as I'm listening to the both of you of um, what, what is it about, what is it about the church context specifically that makes this more prevalent? Is there the culture of the church or particular things that um, these individuals are doing um, within the context of the church that, that makes this statistic maybe more prevalent? Well, I think we have some unique weaknesses in um, the church, and I'm saying capital C, the big church. We have unique weaknesses, and uh, to some extent, even more profound weaknesses in our evangelical context, and that is because we're grace-based. We say, come as you are, there are no perfect people here. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that was before he knew Jesus. Mm -hmm. So we've got a lot of paradigms in place that limit um, our understanding of this issue. We're not licensed. I don't think we should be licensed. I don't want more government in my life, and I certainly don't want it in my church. But one of the realities with licensures, as Paula knows, is, and, I, and me as well, any licensed profession has continuing education requirements. Right. Therefore, we are kept abreast of current standards of care. So that's important from a legal standpoint for the church, standards of care, what you should have in place to address this issue that you don't, what you've allowed to occur that you should not have allowed to occur. That's legal standards of care. And the church, because it isn't licensed, and again, I don't think it should be, but because we're not, we're not conversant with current standards of care. We tend to be way behind any child serving context that otherwise is allowed to provide services to children. Certainly that's true in the U.S. and Canada. Mm -hmm. Paula, any, anything just from your perspective, uh, whether yeah. working with churches or in your, your uh, clinical experience of why it might be more prevalent? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things is just our kind of our history and just how we deal with with questions of sexuality in the church. There is kind of an ignorance around sexuality in a sense. It's not something we address. I think our silence around that is often uh, telling. Um, every year, one of my classes, I, my trauma class, I often ask students, how many of you have heard, uh, ever heard a sermon on incest or child abuse or domestic violence from the pulpit? And um, I think three years ago, one, one student had heard one uh, sermon on domestic violence. So, you know, it's this huge area of uh, problem that we're not even addressing. You don't talk about it in discipleship groups, you don't address anywhere, and we just kind of live in this Pollyanna fashion often, oftentimes. Yeah, and I would riff off of that, Paula. I think part of the issue here is, you referenced this earlier, 90% of kids are sexually abused by someone they know and trust, and the child sexual abuse risk Mm -hmm. um, they're abused by someone they know and trust. This is not a stranger. This is not a stranger danger issue. Mm -hmm. And typically what the church has, the protections that the church has in place, when I do a, an evaluation of any ministry, I hear about two things as it relates to this specific risk, child sexual abuse risk. I hear about matching tag systems, security cameras on campus, um, I hear about criminal background checks mm -hmm. and the, the first, those first two security protocols are totally tied to the idea of stranger danger, danger. that the, the, that the problem and the risk and the place of potential um, difficulty, the place where this is going to manifest is someone outside the fence. When in fact, 90% of kids are sexually abused by someone they know and trust. It is someone inside the fence. It's someone from their core world or it's someone, heaven forbid, within your ministry who is using your ministry to gain access to kids within their age and gender of preference. And the church totally misses the boat about where the danger manifests because they misconstrue and they believe stranger danger. Stranger danger, the abduction offender is less than 5% of convicted offenders. The great weight and majority of offenders are not the snatch and grab um, amber alert sort of thing, but the protections the church tends to put in place are based on that understanding of the risk. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it just speaks to our level of denial, right. About, about who we think the, who we think that where we think the problem is or who we think are the, the problems. It kind of keeps the focus away from the real problem. Yeah. 
it's certainly more comfortable to think it's coming from out there than yeah. to think it's within our midst. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and as I was listening to all of you, just to just to kind of pull together some of the things that you noticed. So a part of what the the culture of the church that kind of contributes, one is just that level of comfort or the denial of, of you said issues of sexuality, Dr. Tempton, and um, as well as lack of training related to protocols for what you might even do, which is where Ministry Safe, I know, will step in and I, uh, um, we're going to have some time to plug that. Um, and, and, and maybe some of the cultural uh, narratives around, you said, stranger danger, rather than it being somebody outside, it's somebody that we know and trust. It makes me think, so given those misconceptions, this is a really important conversation for us to maybe have our own awareness, but it leads me to another question that, that I left for both of you maybe to address is when you think about like the key characteristics of people um, uh, or characteristics of, of people who groom uh, children to be abused, um, can, can you all speak to um, what sorts of things you notice in both Paula for your private practice, clinical experience, work in the church and um, Kimberly, you too, in, in your, in your work, in your, um, in your law firm. What are those characteristics, grooming characteristics that you notice in the perpetrators that are that are important for maybe ministry professional to pay attention to? Yeah, so this goes to the difference between um, the, the, the offender when I stand over the train wrecks 31 years in. Um, almost without exception in ministry context, when the abuser is within the ministry, the abuser is what is known as a preferential offender. The preferential offender is an individual who prefers a child as a sexual partner. They may be 85% of convicted male offenders are married and have children of their own. Um, so it's not just that single guy, but a preferential offender prefers a child as a sexual partner, almost without exception, other than the true pedophile. We'll kind of get back to that. But the preferential offender has an age range and gender of child with whom they prefer to have sexual interaction. So from our standpoint, the key to this risk in uh, church context, child serving context, is understanding molesters groom kids for sexual interaction. It is a process. And the good news about that is it's a process that is visible. It is viewable. And therefore, it is preventable if you know what you're looking for and you have appropriate policies in place that prevent these common grooming behaviors. But the second principle is just as important, and that is this, um, uh, molesters groom the gatekeepers. So they mm -hmm. groom the people who are surround that uh, who are in that circumstance, in that ministry, to believe they're helpful, trustworthy, responsible people. Uh, now, I've yet to encounter a case where when I am talking to people after the fact, someone says, I knew that guy was a slime ball. It doesn't happen. What you hear instead is, I'm so shocked. He seemed like the nicest guy. And that is not coincidental. Because what those offenders in those contexts are looking for is trusted time alone with the children in your ministry program. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to give that if you don't think that person is trustworthy. So yeah. those types of, you know, there are all kinds of characteristics. We've got like 50 years of offender studies now that we can look at actual life characteristics but in terms of boots in the sand, looking uh, at how to prevent this from occurring within your ministry, like somebody comes to your ministry for the purpose of targeting kids, it's great. We got to clearly understand the grooming process of the offender. Great. Paula, I saw you nodding your head a couple of times there. Yeah, no, it's really, it's, it's just so critical. And, and, the, and the truth is, is most, you know, most people aren't aren't trained and don't know what they're looking at and kind of this idea this Christian idea that we always believe the best and we see people interacting you know positively with kids and we get warm fuzzy feelings about that but the uh, the idea that the groomer is actually grooming the community as as well as the child right and uh, I think we have to realize these these guys are skilled you know they're 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 skillful at what they do they're they they've they've thought it through they have a plan they're going to look for kids uh, who are who are needy in some way. Maybe just feel a, you know their self esteem is a little bit lower than normal. They don't have a they stand out from the crowd. They don't have a good friend. So they just they know they have the spotlight out on these kids. They could just, they they know that they could have a relationship with quite quickly. Mm -hmm. Right. And so they've got access to the children. Um, you know they develop trust through secrets and and kind of making a child feel special. 
And then eventually those uh, relationships turn into desensitizing the child to the touch and the sexual touch. And, um, you know, their whole, all along, their parents and everybody around thinks that this is a, a, a great person and would, like uh, Kimberly was saying, would be absolutely, would absolutely be shocked. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I think uh, I'm so grateful to, for the kinds of training that some of these organizations do to, that can help church, churches really have their eyes uh, wide open to, to what's going on. That brings up another question that as I was listening to you all talk about the characteristics of groomers, um, and I, I'm, I'm really curious too, you mentioned a little bit there, Paula, of um, children that may be more at risk. Um, so I'm thinking, what are some of the risk factors for children who are most likely to be perpetrated, uh, uh, as well as are there certain signs and symptoms when you look at kiddos that would be indicative of um, uh, a kiddo who might have, have experienced it. Yeah, I, I think there, there are there are possible indicators. And of course, not all these indicators mean that a child is actually being abused. Sure. But certainly, if you see a shift in behavior, you see a shift in performance at school, you see uh, children kind of crying for, for no reason at all. Um, you might notice more sexualized behavior in their in their play, right. uh, you know, kind of experimenting more. Sometimes you'll see uh, you know, more aggressive behavior, destructive behavior, self-destructive behavior, uh, and inability to uh, respond well to adults. So I think the main thing is just to notice if there's a shift, right? And then look at what a shift in behavior and the shift in the norm, and then begin to be curious about what, mm -hmm. what kind of shift is going on and maybe start paying attention to those particular behaviors. And, um, you know, kids don't know how to use words. They don't know how, they don't have words, vocabulary for sexuality and for sexual language. And, you know, and so uh, for the most part, they're going to act it out some way behaviorally. Yeah, that's an important point. Um, Kimberly, how about for you? Yeah, I think the kids that I've encountered um, in this realm, the children, and just like really what we see from academic studies as well, um, Offenders tend to target kids who are on the edge, on the fringe, what we call the edge of the herd. Mm -hmm. um, they tend to create, they're really good at figuring, um, creating a, a peer-like interaction with that child. So they'll get down on that child's le level. They're really good at making them feel, feel special, chosen, cared for. They're really good at figuring out what your kid wants. Now, let's be frank. I'm a mom. I mean, a lot of you are parents. How hard would it be for some interested adult to figure out what your kid wants, right? But they're really good at figuring out what your children in your program want or need and giving it to them. And so they create a bond. They tend to target those kids who are on the edge. You know, those kids can be on the edge for a lot of different reasons. They can be, um, have a disability in any form. They can be an introvert rather than an extrovert. Um, they can be from a single parent home where uh, they're kind of strapped for mom or dad's time or attention. They, they can be a kid who's looking for someone to follow or trust because they feel a little disconnected. Um, so, uh, you know, I, as well, I'm seeing kids, children who have physical touch as a dominant love language are a, a bit more likely to be targeted. And I've had offenders tell me so, because there's just not as far to go as they participate in that barrier testing and erosion, pushing back what a child will accept currently, pushing back what is acceptable from a physical standpoint. And those children who have physical touch as a dominant love language, there's just less far to go. They already want that kind of physical interaction with an adult who seems to care about them. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, thank you both. Uh, there's a couple of other questions that we're going to get to, but before we do that, I'd like to invite James on to take um, an audience question. So, yes, we have one here um, for the inside the fence. Since we're talking about the church, what kind of protections and programs do you guys recommend to set up within the church, kind of structure wise? Okay. Oh, well, um, so. Yeah. What, yeah, what we do, Ministry Safe, is two things. It's the law firm where we give legal advice to both secular and uh, ministry organizations. My biggest secular client is the U.S. Olympic Committee, who retained us to create their safe sport protocols. Heaven knows they need them. 
Um, but our sweet spot is the church. We created Ministry Safe to um, put information and tools and resources, sample policies, screening practices, screening training, awareness training about sexual abuse in a form that's deliverable and scalable. I'm the daughter of a church planter. I'm the daughter of an evangelist. Uh, most of the smalls, the plants, the smaller churches can't afford for someone like me or my law partner to come on site and help create those types of resources. Um, so everything that we've put together, what we call the five-part safety system, which is awareness training, um, understanding the misconceptions, replacing that with good information, effective screening processes, training your people who screen to recognize a risk indicator when they see one, Mm -hmm. um, an appropriate criminal background check, policies and procedures that dovetail into that training and monitoring and oversight. So adequate supervision, doing what you say you do. So mm -hmm. every aspect of what I just described is available in a self-help kind of context at uh, ministrysafe.com. And we did it because we saw these patterns in the way that individuals were accessing kids in those environments. And the good news out of that is if it's viewable, it's preventable. So mm -hmm. that's my advice. Okay, thank you. And Paula? I think, um, you know, from a, like, if you could just look over your, the way the, the, the church is organized right now or how the uh, Sunday schools and youth ministries are organized. In general, we kind of tend to, in our evangelical church, to set up uh, kind of a one-person leadership system. We're kind of like one youth minister in charge, one pastor in charge up there by himself. And that right there is just such a huge setup. So I would say at the very least, I would want to see team teaching in Sunday schools. I would want to see male and female team teaching in youth programs, always having, you know, not ever having one person who's got a lot of power and, um, and have more shared power. And uh, obviously, you know, kids not being uh, alone with, with one youth leader one way or the other is kind of a, in a, at a simple perspective would be one thing that would be helpful. So I think from a, I think the first, from my standpoint, I think the first issue is train your people. A real close second is institute the two adult rule and um, uphold it, like fire people if they don't. Because if you have two trained screened adults present every time you're providing services to children, which is hard for the church because we're heavily volunteer driven and we have a hard time with that. Right. But the two adult rule by itself goes a long way toward, if they're trained, goes a long way toward for, uh, preventing child sexual abuse actually in ministry context. Yeah, it makes sense, especially as you were talking about as being yeah, one of the characteristics of those who groom is getting your child alone. So having some way of circumventing that seems really important. Sure. As you guys were, as you all were describing that, um, I was also curious both in terms of processes, like the structures of the church and different ideas. I'm also wondering, are there a particular um, maybe groups or individuals within the church that may need, um, as you're thinking about providing support or creating structures to help support people that might be important to pay attention to? You mentioned a little bit um, about maybe certain vulnerable groups within the church, but I'm just curious if you have any ideas about, about that. Here we go. So supporting... Well, what comes to mind for me is if your ministry provides services to single parents, particularly single moms, be aware that that is a very common MO for abusers to right. come alongside, date, even marry single moms to gain access to their kids. So if you have a program providing services to single parents, be aware that that's a very common uh, MO and you don't want people in your program utilizing that access point. Mm -hmm. to gain access to kids. Very helpful. Thank you, Kimberly. Mm -hmm. Dr. Tipton? I don't, I don't have anything to add to that. Okay. All right. I'll ask another question from the, uh, from the audience. Can you address how certain teachings and cultures around sexuality, uh, especially the purity culture that has been around for a while, can affect sexual abuse in the church? Dr. Tipton, I might point that one to you first, if that's okay. Yeah, I think, you know, again, all, overall, there's this, um, you know, either we have silence in the church or we then we have this whole big purity culture thing. So the goodness of sexuality, of course, is, is, is not really often addressed. And um, 
but I think again the setup the the setup in churches is is just the really the silence and I think the idea of and the the leadership not having having all of life not being really talked about in terms of discipleship systems or in, in education systems and just kind of over bypassing that whole area of sexuality completely. So I think we've either gone to like sex is really bad, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And then you've got the kid sitting in the pew thinking, oh my gosh, that's happened to me, that's happened to me. And then where does he go, right? Because mm -hmm. then he's scared and he's done something wrong. And so how do we create a culture even where uh, we have safe places for people to go? Um, because I, you know, it's it's all bad, right? And and kids are scared. Mm -hmm. They don't know that it's not their fault. Often, right away. Right. Kimberly, is there anything you might add to that from your perspective? Um, seen with yeah. Them? So I I think that there are. Um, I did a parent training about a year ago with my adult daughter. She's now twenty five and a law student at Duke. Um, and the, my, the purpose of that training was to speak directly to parents about this specific issue related to their own kids. And what I see over and over again in Christ-based context, maybe even particularly evangelical context, is parents who are uh, waiting way too long to have conversations about sexuality. Mm -hmm. So part of the point of that training was, um, if you wait, it's too late because kids have natural sexual curiosity. They're going to start looking for sources of information. They're going to get this information from somewhere. They'll get it from their peers. That'll be super accurate, right? They're going to get it from the internet or from their smartphone. Um, there, you know, there are offenders out there who are using these access points, that natural sexual curiosity to provide information to children who are looking for information for the wrong purpose. But, you know, um, I think it's really important that the church equip parents to have those conversations early and often. I started when my child was two. You know, we had cats. They were very prolific. We had a new litter of kittens about every eight months for a short space in time because there's apparently this six second time period within which the cat is no longer fertile. Um, but that was a great learning curve for my daughter. You know, it takes a mama cat. It takes a daddy cat. That's where little cats come from. Calling mm -hmm. genitalia by their real names, you know, taking the mystery out of it so that to this day, my adult child who's married um, will come to me with questions about sexuality. And that's because the line of communication was open from a very, very young age and, um, you know, we've got a lot of parents out there in the church who are afraid to have this conversation. And when they have it, it's so awkward. Yeah. It's when their child's a preteen or later. And um, it's, we need to be, we need to be a, a great, easy, open avenue of information to our kids about sexuality so that they come to us to ask the questions so that they come to us when they encounter something as my child did on her phone that she didn't know what it meant. Mm. Right. Uh, and I don't think I would have heard about that, but for that really open conversation that started when she was really young. Right. Paul, I saw you nodding your head. Was there, was there something yeah. you were thinking as you were? Ab absolutely that? agree. You know, just cultivating a culture of sex positivity and openness from the get-go. Like this is not a, this is a, a human or a human reality you know it's a life reality and it's not it's not shameful and then then we recognize when it when it's gone bad right like oh this is not what you know mom and dad are talking about you know something's different here right mm -hmm. well and as i was listening to the both of you it sounded like there's there's like the things that we can do per the audience question within the church procedures and policies you can establish um but that there's there's other kind of cultural uh, uh narratives or stories that kind of keep it, uh, uh, keep the church and, and us, uh, you know, us as parents, um, potentially at a, at a, uh, at a default for um, allowing these, uh, allowing children to be more susceptible. So one thing we can do really practically is think about our own families, think about how to start the conversation early and uh, as a part of trying to change that culture, which, you know, families make up the church. So, um, so James, I don't, I don't know if we have another question here, but um, I've got another one here. Um, if, if unless you have one from the audience, yeah, this one is this one's interesting. Um, 
can each of you speak to um, the, the prevalence or existence of female perpetrators uh, in addition to the male perpetrators? Yeah, okay. so it's a 90, it's a 90, 10 split in the convicted population. 90% of convicted offenders um, are male, 10% are female. I, I think that statistic probably pretty closely models um, real life, but we don't really know because females are less likely to be prosecuted. It's more difficult to get a prosecution. We have a cultural predisposition to believe that females are, that women are caregivers. Um, we have a cultural predisposition that says uh, women don't do those kinds of things, but I've encountered female preferential offenders repeatedly. Um, we're beginning to see prosecutions since, say, the late 80s, early, early to mid 90s of female offenders who the, the typical female offender was in a caregiving role. Years ago, when I would train and I didn't reference or spend much time discussing female offenders in ministry context, I would have men approach me after the training and tell me that they were sexually assaulted by a female. They were sexually abused as a child by a female, usually, typically either in a babysitting context um, or in their early teen years by a, a significantly older female. Um, so female offenders do exist. They are statistically less prevalent than male offenders by everyone's estimation. Uh, but in the actual convicted population, the split is 90-10. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Kimberly. How about you, Paula? Any, anything you might add to that? Um, Maybe yeah, what you've I, in your my, practice. My stats are about the same. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so if, if a ministry professional or, uh, a parent were to, um, hear an allegation of sexual abuse, um, how should parents, ministry professionals respond to that? If you ever hear a kiddo who, who is making an allegation, what words or statements or actions should, um, we do and what should we avoid? Well, I'll speak to it from a legal standpoint and let Paula speak to it from a therapeutic standpoint. Um, there are two, two things that child needs to hear right away. I believe you and it's not your fault. Mm -hmm. Okay. False allegations are rare. They are two to 5%, depending on which study you look at, but false allegations are rare. Kids don't make this stuff up. Um, so in general, I would tell a ministry professional, you need to listen and respond calmly because that child needs you to be the grown-up in this equation. Uh, you need to uh, be sensitive to vague or partial disclosures, because two out of three kids don't tell until adulthood, just statistically across the board. But when you look at studies about, did you try to tell? And if you didn't tell, why didn't you tell? Number one reason, study after study after study, if I tell, no one's going to believe me. Mm -hmm. So, um, and molesters will tell kids, if you tell, who, do, who are they going to believe? They're going to believe you or are they going to believe me? And I'm going to tell them that you're lying and you'll get in trouble for lying. So that means you're going to receive as a ministry professional, you're going to, if you're that trusted adult that a kid comes to, you are likely to receive vague or partial disclosures. And you shouldn't ask questions that assume sexual abuse occurred, but it's totally okay to ask open-ended questions like what happened next? Um, is there something else you'd like to tell me? Um, reporting to appropriate authorities is key. Uh, clergy are mandatory reporters in uh, nearly every state in the United States and the entire um, uh, province of Canada. Um, so mandatory reporting requirements, understanding your reporting requirements, um, you know, not asking shaming questions. And that mm. sounds so self-evident, but the ones I encounter are, how long has this been happening and why didn't you tell someone? <clears throat> or if, it, if they're telling about something that happened years ago, decades ago, what I, the shaming question is, if this was actually happening, why did you keep coming back to our program? Or mm. why didn't you tell someone sooner? Which places um, so we don't want to- On the kiddo, yeah, right. 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 It's basically blaming them for their own abuse. My personal favorite is what were you wearing? That's a big one. Um, and then the last thing on the list, no secrets. So uh, pretty regularly, a child will come to a trusted adult in a ministry setting and say, if I tell you something, can you keep it confidential? Can you keep it secret? 
And we've got to train our people to say, there are some things I cannot keep secret. If you're mm -hmm. being harmed, if another child's being harmed, mm -hmm. um, I can't keep that secret. I believe you. Um, I'm going to do my best to support you, but I can't keep that secret. And if that child goes on to tell you about a crush on a boy, well, by all means, take it to your grave. <laughs> but we've got to train our people. There are some things you cannot keep secret. Yeah. Thank you, Kimberly. Uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Tipton? Yeah, I think Kimberly alluded to the to the the one piece about um, you know remembering that these the perpetrators are going to set kids up. They're going to think, well, what if a kid ever did talk, right? So they're they're already thinking ahead of time on how to set the kid up on, on what he would say or not say, uh, mm -hmm. so that the kid is going to be rendered in some ways, uh, you know, helpless and useless, and that he you know thinking they're not going to be believed, and that's uh, huge. And so. Uh, why questions are always so judgmental. I would say cut the why questions out of your vocabulary completely when talking with a kid. Um, you don't want to ask leading questions where you're putting information in their mind. But I think if you just say, oh, so tell me about your friendship with Jack. Tell me about well, what do you guys do, you know, and, and you know, what made you scared or just leaving uh, questions open. Um, you know, when a report's made, there are forensic interviewers, and this is their expertise. They know how to interview kids and, and help them out. I think the main thing is we just don't batter kids with questions, because even that battering them with questions makes them just feel like, wow, what did I do wrong? You know, they don't, they don't know what to, ha they don't know how to answer. They're scared. They, they don't have the vocabulary often to put it to words. It, and that makes me think too, I, I imagine even as a parent, um, you know, you, you have tons of questions about what happened and when it happened and um, under what circumstances and are, are there are there certain uh, pieces of encouragement you might give to parents um, related to that? And I heard you say a little bit about, you know, not not asking leading questions, but instead, here's what to ask using open questions or recommendations you might give to parents in that in that moment of the of the um, of them, yeah. of them telling them. So number yeah. one, number one recommendation, believe your kid. Yes, yes. Yeah. Believe your kid yeah. and create separation. Don't, don't, <laughs> do not require that your kids spend time in the presence of their abuser any further. Right. So right. That, that's my number one recommendation. Thank yeah. you. And then giving them the, the freedom to, you know, this wasn't your fault. You are, you are, you know, thank you for telling me this. And you, uh, you mm -hmm. can tell me as you can tell me more about it when, you, when you're ready, the, the doors open. Um, I think just them having that sense of, yeah, I'm not being blamed and judged. Well, you know, and because kids, 90% of children are sexually abused by someone they know and trust, it's likewise someone that the family knows and trusts, typically. Right. So um, just keep in mind, parents, it's going to be difficult to believe about someone difficult to suspect, mm. but believe I mean, your kid. Mm. I love that. Well, it makes me think too, um, you know, as, the, uh, as, as being a parent, how do I then engage with the potential perpetrator? I love what you said earlier about the importance of, of reporting it as soon as you're finding out so that you don't have to be in the position of, of investigating or asking questions yourself because there are people who professionals that you need to connect with at that point. Um, and James, I, I've got one more question here that that I wanted to ask the panelists, but um, I wanted to be mindful of the, the audience questions as well. So I'm going to sneak in here and ask one that I came up Do with. It. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds uh, great. We okay. are a seminary. So um, yeah, here's some, I just want to know, uh, for each of you who've dealt with these situations by hearing stories, and counseling people who've experienced this, uh, this kind of uh, these experiences. Um, how has it personally affected your own spiritual lives and your faith? Hmm. Well, I, you know, for, for me, I've worked with mostly adults who have kept these secrets and kept their stories for a long, long time because they didn't think they would be believed or valued. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I think just seeing the devastation to lives, not just for, you know, for a couple of weeks or for a couple of months, but you're looking at a lifetime of people living in, 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 in devastation and struggling with a sense of self that feels uh, lovable and worthy and, um, and, you know, trying to have good, healthy connections, have good, healthy marriages. And so, you know, it's, it's, 
it's something that it doesn't go away, you know, whether, uh, and so I think just, uh, you know, listening to a, a victim's cry out of, you know, where was God when this happened? How come God didn't protect me? And the sense of feeling so unprotected and so alone. And some of that is because it begins with an, an unincarnational church and, you know, refusing to be there and be present and be with someone at critical times. They just kind of, you know, get abandoned or not believed or pushed out the door of the church. And so the, it's uh yeah, it, it really causes you to, to understand how, uh, you know, I think the heart of the father is just broken and mm -hmm. we can either participate with him in that, in that, uh, that sadness and keep moving toward healing or we become part of the problem yeah. in our silence. Thank you, Dr. I, I would say for me, um, you know, I'm a crusader by nature that's the way God made me. And I have a justice thing. I know that's shocking for a lawyer, <laughs> but um, I'm in a position over and over where I'm standing over a scenario and telling, and typically with multiple victims, sometimes dozens. Mm -hmm. And I am instructing leadership. Here's what you do next to, to navigate this well. Here's how you support those children, now adults who are coming forward, or sometimes they're still, still children. Um, believe the allegation, false allegations are rare, support that individual, have an, an, a victim centric approach rather than an organization centric approach or heaven forbid an abuser centric reproach or approach. So yeah. I think because that's kind of the way God made me, I'm, for me, it is, I feel like I'm making a difference in the kingdom and it, it kind of bolsters my faith. Now I, think that for me, that also requires that I kind of have some separation between my work life and rest of life. Um, but I, I think I'm one of the few, I'm one of the few lawyers you will ever run across that knows I'm doing precisely what I'm supposed to be doing. And it, it dovetails directly into the way God made me and I, um, love what I do. So I feel privileged that God allows me to do this. It's hard facts. It's hard information that I'm processing day after day after day after day, but I think it makes a difference for the kingdom and that makes it worthwhile. Yeah. And hearing you both say that I can, I can hear the passion and as well as that aligning with, you know, the, the purpose and how you kind of see yourselves. Um, I thought it was really interesting in my own training as a counselor, there are certain populations I never thought that I could work with. And one of those being perpetrators of sexual child, sexual abuse and I remember just thinking as I was wrestling with that in my in my faith and just thinking about the problem of suffering. And as I started to, as a part of my my training to um, work with perpetrators, that the Lord reminded me of um, just people being made in his image. And, and often I found that the perpetrators often had some sort of story of trauma in their own lives. Mm -hmm. And not that it excuses behavior, not that there shouldn't be conse obviously consequences for behavior, but that those individuals, as well as the children, uh, that whom they sexually abused, that there was a need for um, hearing and loving and meeting that person where they were, holding them accountable, just as Jesus held, holds us accountable <laughs> for our behaviors, but um, that this person was in need of love and and was made in the image of God as well. And I, I think that was important for me for reframing to how could I love this individual? Not that it doesn't mean, not that it excuses behavior, not that it doesn't mean people experience consequences, but that they're worthy and deserve love as well. Um, which is hard... yeah, right. Not that they should be leading your children's ministry. Absolutely. Right? And there yeah. should be boundaries and barriers <laughs> right. put in place so that we continue to protect people. That's mm -hmm. what I was saying. Consequences there, sure. <laughs> you know, which sure. relates to uh, a last question that I had. And it makes me think, so you guys talked about the, the culture of the church and some of the things that might lead to um, this being kind of a ripe spot for it to happen. I know you mentioned Kimberly on the podcast with with Dawn that, uh, and I want I want to put this to both of you that are a culture of, of grace and forgiveness within the church. I think it's been misunderstood, uh, in that you know putting the the child before their abuser and and having that the abuser apologize or something like that. Which, from a clinical perspective, I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. <laughs> um, and and I know, but uh, I'm gonna let you speak to it. Um, but but. I want to say more about that. What does, how does grace and forgiveness, what does it mean in these circumstances um, in a way that 
helps us to continue to protect children, but allows us to set up maybe thoughtful, thoughtful barriers. Um, yeah. Well, I think she, she, you go ahead, Paula. I, oh, I have I'm just saying, you know, sometimes I think we just, you know, we try to get to forgiveness before and we buy and we, um, we go past, uh, I think, uh, spiritual outrage <laughs> and we try to get to uh, forgiveness too soon without with, with bypassing over our outrage and and the anger and the um the 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 feelings that we should feel of protection for children right and so we want to get to we want to get to forgiveness really soon because it's part of our culture of denial and like everything's okay it's really not our problem and we move over things very quickly and i think it's just uh, i mean th that's outrageous that that kind of behavior and it, there's no excuse for us to um live in that kind of inauthenticity as as believers but mm -hmm. it's you know this is hard information and we choose to you know we we have a hard time handling it and so um i tell my clients that you may never get to the place of forgiveness at right now in this in your earthly existence, and I'm not going to judge you for that. That's between them and God, what they've got the grace to do, what they've got the capacity for. But I think for any of us to put someone in a position where we have to, where we tell them, like, you know, this is now your problem because you're not forgiving, you're holding on to a root of bitterness. I think that is the most uncompassionate and and borderline unethical thing that we can um, put on on victims is basically saying that they're the problem. Mm -hmm. I think cheap forgiveness is unethical and harmful. Mm -hmm. And, you know, frankly, it plays into the hands of the offender oh, because I prom promise you the offender is looks very repentant most of the time. Mm -hmm. So offenders will admit to some of the, the equation, but not all of it typically, and they'll appear repentant. And this leads to churches or ministries that attempt to handle this within the church, which is not only a bad idea, it's a crime mm. in every state for clergy. Failure to report is a crime. And when, as an example, in uh, Colorado, this should, this should make your hair stand on end if you run a ministry in Colorado. As a, for instance, in the state of Colorado and half a dozen other states currently, if you're a mandatory reporter and you fail to report, it's a crime that you can be prosecuted for, and there are cases happening. But secondarily, in the state of Colorado and half a dozen other states, if you fail to report as a mandatory reporter, you are responsible from a monetary standpoint. You are liable for what happens next. Hmm. So when that offender goes to the next place or stays at your place and continues to offend, you can be held responsible from a civil liability standpoint for what happens next. Um, so I just encounter a lot of scenarios where churches want to rush into cheap forgiveness and we'll handle this in-house and we don't want to um in any way we, we don't want to in any way impact the reputation of our church or jesus i'm pretty sure jesus can hold his own um so just that that's where i see that going commonly it's very destructive for the for the child you know my experience from a civil liability standpoint we're not here talking about availing you know avoiding being sued but from a civil liability standpoint people sue their church because of how they're treated after they come forward. Right, right. And I imagine there's a tension there too, because of the, uh, I mean, a desire for truth when somebody seems to be truly repentant, which you, as you mentioned, those individuals are usually repeat offenders. They say what they need to say in order to have access to, to the, the child, but that mm -hmm. we, we are, um, as, as believers in Christ, what a tension there of how do we extend for forgiveness but also continue to establish important um, barriers between them and, and further um, um, uh, harming of other children. And I think that's the tension that, that, that you guys alluded to there. Yeah. So we have just a, oh yeah, please. Paula, we're going to jump in. I thought I heard something. Well, I was just going to say, I think, you know, one of the, one of the most dangerous kinds of perpetrators are actually those who actually grow up in the church, right? Because 
they they have the language, they have the culture, they know the weaknesses, they understand the whole idea of, you know, forgiveness, repentance, and, you know, being sorrowful, and they, they'll play on that, they'll play on that, because they've grown up in that culture, and they know how to, how to work it. Yeah. Yeah. Offenders are, are very willing to play the Jesus card. Right. Well, thank you all so very much. Uh, James, do we have any other questions from the, the audience before we wrap up here? We do, but I think we've uh, run our time. So go ahead and yeah, do what you need to do. Okay. Well, uh, we just want to invite, first of all, I just want to thank you, uh, Dr. Tempton uh, and um, uh, Kimberly for uh, spending time with us today to talk about child sexual abuse and uh, how to recognize it and how to begin to think about how to um, prevent it and some of the implications for that as both ministry professionals and as parents. And um, so I'd like to invite you, if you'd like to, to speak a little bit to maybe your current work or uh, anything else you'd like to share with us before we uh, adjourn. So, Holly, you first. Um, I don't have any really current work here going except for this this current work right here, which would be um, <laughs> if you're a pastor living, uh, listening to this, or you're a, a youth leader, please please do whatever you can to get training, to put policies in place, to get yourself out of a position of having to try to hold the church together because there's been an abuse allegation and try to, you know, keep that together. Uh, this is uh, li such life damaging, uh, you know, material and things that happen. And so please just get the help, get the training you need. And I think we can begin to hopefully get, a, get ahead of this problem. Yeah, thank you, Paula. Kimberly? Yeah, and so I would just I would just uh, aim anybody listening who um, sees some sense of lapse, perhaps in your own ministry, given uh, related to this specific risk. Um, I would encourage you to take a look at ministrysafe.com and look at the resources that are available there. Feel free to reach out to me directly, Kimberly Norris, one of the founders. Um, and if you are by chance a seminary student currently, there's also, I'm faculty at Dallas Theological Seminary, and we teach an online class every spring that's aimed at ministry professionals, uh, that is child sexual abuse and ministry context. So you can take a look at that as well. Thank you both for your expertise and your passion and your time. Uh, it's an honor to be with you. Uh, and thank you audience for, for being here. Um, and uh, look forward to seeing you in the next In Perspective. Take care, everybody. <laughs>